Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it this night, written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you most recently about the subject of the end time, mighty, perfected, glorious church that God is raising up and will raise up to be that remnant, the few that are walking in the ways of the Lord that will see the glory of God poured out. The only ones that will see this happen are the ones who meet his conditions. And we are looking through the New Testament and looking at the Word of God that brings a revelation of what is necessary to see this be accomplished. We talked about 1 Corinthians today, and we saw that it speaks of, if we even go back to 1 Corinthians for a moment, in chapter 1, where we saw that we're not to come behind in any gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to confirm you or strengthen you and establish you and make you firm until the end that you might be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants you to become strong, established, and firm. He wants you to be blameless. That is what, his, what he will accomplish as you hear and do the word. Well, we talked about all the different things that, that were brought forth in the first letter to the Corinthian church. And this was a church that had lots of problems. They were involved in strife and arguments. They were involved in debates going in the church, which is not of God. They were carnal. They were not in one accord. They were defiled. They were involved in all kinds of sinful things, fornication, all kind of sexual activity, leaven. They were all full of leaven, which is leavening the whole lump. They were unrighteous. They were not being temperate. They were involved in idolatry and selfishness and pride, and the works of the flesh were rampant. Well, they had come to the Lord, and God was beginning to do a good work in them. And so Paul wrote to them, calling them to repentance and warning them what, the, what will happen if they don't get right, showing them the fact that they need to make sure that they are walking in the way of the Lord unto the coming of the Lord to be blameless before him. And that's what God expects. Well, we come to 2 Corinthians tonight we're going to talk about. And here's Paul writing to them. And he writes about the fact of the persecution that was coming against him. And you must understand that persecution is going to come against the body of Christ as we go down these last days. He says in verse 3, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, all the pressure that was coming against them, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. They had lots of attacks that were coming against them. In verse 8, he said, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, where we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. We had the sentence of death in ourselves. Oh, the people were going to kill them. That we should not trust in ourselves, though, but in God, which raiseth the dead. They would believe that God would raise them from the dead. Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, and whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. They had confidence in God in the midst of the persecution. You need to get strong now, so that when any persecution comes, you will be able to deal successfully with whatever might come against you. Now, if we're going to do that, we need to know many things. And he points out a lot of things that are important for them in order to overcome and to be victorious. 2 Corinthians 1.20 For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Every promise God is available, every promise available to be performed in our life, even times of persecution and different things, the promises still are sure. God will still perform His word. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. You need to know that the promises of God are yes, and He will perform them in your life if you will do what He says and meet the conditions necessary to see it accomplished. Furthermore, He says, Now He which establisheth us this is a word we've seen a couple times already. Make us firm and establish us. Make us sure with you in Christ. And that's what he's going to do in your life. 
He's going to make you firm. He's going to make you get established. He's going to make you sure so you are not moved by anything that the enemy would bring against you. We see also that if they were going to see this happening, there certainly was going to have to be obedience in their life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, he says this, For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. What's the proof of us? The proof, the trial, showing forth whether we're approved before God or not. God will test every one of us. He tests us with his word to see whether we're going to obey it, so whether we see the promises performed in our life. What's the proof of you and me? What's the answer going to be? It's whether we're obedient in all things. If you're obedient in all things, that shows the proof that you are following the Lord, you're doing what He says, and you will see God perform His word and bring those promises to pass. God expects us to be obedient if we are going to overcome. He goes on and says, To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave it I and the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. They needed to be ready to forgive. Every one of us need to be ready to forgive. Forgive any person who has done us wrong or might do us wrong at any time in our life. You cannot have unforgiveness, resentments, bitterness, negative attitudes towards people, or you have given place to the devil. We must walk in love at all times. We saw that in 1 Corinthians 13. It is mandatory that you and I walk in love and not allow ourselves to get in the flesh and be unforgiving or bitter or resentful or angry or upset and allow the enemy to work against us. Satan will get an advantage of us. We cannot be ignorant of his devices. He'll try to set you up to get you to get out of the spirit and react negatively in situations and draw people to try to be destructive against you. But the good news is we can overcome. doesn't matter what comes. We come to verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. You know, that's when you and I do what he says. He will bring that to pass. And when he talks about always triumphing, present tense, continuous repeated action, God will cause you to triumph in every situation if you do what the Word says, of course. If you don't do what it says, then you could let the enemy come and bring destruction. Remember, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God will cause you to triumph if you do what he says in every situation. And he talks about here about making manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. That's because they were going forth preaching the gospel. They were doing what God wanted. They were giving out the truth of the word of God, which is what God wants you to do. And notice what he says after that. For we are unto God, from God's viewpoint, a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. When he talks about those that are saved, remember, we saw this in 1 Corinthians 15, but we see it here again. This is not talking about someone who is saved past tense, that it's a done deal. It is a present tense. Present tense means an ongoing, continuous action. And so this is why Young's translated, translates it correctly, in those being saved. Otherwise, as the word is coming to in those being saved and they respond to it, they'll see that work continue as they're obedient. But also, in those that are not receiving it, it says that's in those being lost or those that are perishing because they have rejected the word. Nonetheless, whether the people are being saved or if they are being lost and perishing, to God, from his standpoint, we are a sweet savor as we're giving the word of God. We can't make people make the right choice, but we can sow the knowledge of God in people and give them the truth so they have an opportunity to respond to the gospel or not. But in the fact that we are to preach the gospel to every creature and get the word into them and get the knowledge to them, then we are being a sweet savor of Christ unto God, regardless of whether they are being saved or whether they are on the road to perishing. We must get the word into people. And we must be sure that it is accurate. He says in verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, 
but as of sincerity and as of God in the sight of God to speak we Christ. They were pure, they were genuine in speaking forth the word accurately. We can't be corrupting the word of God. They had all kinds of problems with them corrupting the word of God. That's why we saw that there were different manuscripts. They were, they were ones that were contrary to the ones that were of there in Antioch, which is really the center of the church. And there were all kinds of corrupt ones that they had to throw out that weren't right. And they were trying to add in books that were not a part of the canon of Scripture and corrupting the Word, deleting things, all kinds of things. We cannot be corrupting the Word of God. That means we've got to be sure that we are learning the Word and we're being accurate, especially as we're going to go forth to speak the Word with purity and, and being genuine and being accurate according to the Word, meaning that you and I must know the exact knowledge of God, precise, correct knowledge. <coughs> well, that means we're going to have to study the Word. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study, this word is the word spadazo, which really means to be diligent. Translated diligent many of the times. It means to be diligent, as Young's brings out. And this particular word about being diligent, this is an imperative mood, so it's a command given unto us. You and I are commanded to be diligent, to show ourselves approved unto God. Two ways. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, because we're going to be doing the works of God. And also, rightly dividing the word of truth. If we rightly divide the word of truth, that means we're going to be sure that we study the word of God accurately or thoroughly, and also, we're going to get revelation from the Holy Spirit. Remember, we don't interpret the Word or try to figure it out ourselves. The Word is the truth. We believe it. And the revelation of it comes by the Holy Spirit in order to be able to rightly divide the Word of truth. Well, there should not be all these doctrinal problems in the body of Christ because the Holy Spirit will lead us into all the truth. People obviously have not been listening to the Holy Spirit and they've not been rightly dividing the word of truth, or else they haven't studied the word like they should. See, they had problems back then. We have problems today as well. In Jude verse 3, he says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Because the enemy was using people that were changing things and watering things down and bringing things that were not right. Many were corrupting the Word of God. We cannot have a corrupt Word of God. We've got to have it exact. It's got to be in line with the Word. And we have pointed out so many times where the Word has been corrupted in the Greek text that has not the basis that's been used in all the modern base versions. It's not the basis for those that are Textus Receptus based. And so we see that there have been deletions of verses, deletions of, of uh, portions of the text, changes that have come which are contrary to the Word of God. So that's why we've got to study the Word, know exactly what it says, and be sure that we are rightly dividing the Word so we do not corrupt the Word. Now as we go forth and we not only receive the Word but preach the Word to others, what's supposed to happen? Well, this word is going to be written in your heart and my heart and in others as well that are receiving it. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, being written, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit is taking his word and writing it. He writes it in your heart and he writes it also in your mind as we've seen in Hebrews 8.10. Not in tables of stone, that's the Old Testament. That's been finished, that's eliminated. But in fleshly tables of the heart. Now, the word is written in our heart and in our mind in the New Testament. Now, you and I are to be the epistle of Christ. As you get the word in you, it's to be written in you, it becomes a part of you, and he brings revelation of it to you. It's to be incorporated into your lifestyle, so it brings forth fruit and you begin to walk in the ways of the Lord, become like Him. And as you do this, we're going to be changed. And we see that as you and I are walking in His ways and developing a face-to-face -face relationship with Him, 
as we are developing a personal intimate fellowship by hearing and doing the word, what's going to happen? 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, that's the manifest presence of God, what's going to happen? Are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This word changed. We've seen it before in scriptures. It's the word metamorpho. Metamorpho is that, if you remember from science class, metamorphosis, which is the change in species, where the caterpillars changed into a butterfly. Well, that's what's going to happen. You're going to be changed into the very image of Jesus Christ. You're going to go from glory to glory, the manifest presence of God to manifest presence of God, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And we see this change, as it talks about, we mentioned that we've seen this before, over in Romans chapter 12, in verse 2, where it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Here's this word metamorpho. We are going to be changed in species by the renewing of our mind. As your mind is getting renewed, and this is a renovation, a complete change for the better, of course, you get renewed to the Word of God, the way of the Spirit, according to the commandments and the sayings of Jesus Christ, the New Testament way of the Spirit, and then you are going to then come to the place of walking in His ways. God wants us to understand that He's going to change you into the very image of Jesus Christ. And it's going to be from glory to glory, manifest presence to manifest presence, and it's going to be by the Holy Spirit, and it's going to be through the Word in you as you are getting your mind renewed as well as the Word in your heart. And we already saw the fact that what God had told them is they needed to get the Word in them so that they got the mind of Christ. We talked about that this morning in the letter of the first Corinthians chapter 2. So God is going to change you. If you're not having changes, there's a problem. We see a statement about that in Psalms 55. Psalms 55 in verse 19. God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth bold, Selah, because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. We should have changes. If we don't have changes, that means we must not be fearing the Lord because if we have a, the fear of God, we're going to be doing the Word and seeing God manifest Himself, the glory of God in our life, to bring about change and accomplish the things that He purposes. We are to be changed into the very image of the Lord. Well, that means we've got to get changed. Not only our mind renewed, <clears throat> But we need to put off things that are not of Him and put on the things that are of Him. We see even back in the Old Testament, in Genesis 35, verse 2, when Jacob said to his household and to all that were with him, he said, Put away the strange gods that are among you. Get rid of all the idols. And be clean. They're to be cleansed. And change your garments. We are to change our garments. And we are going to do what the Word says, which is to put off the things that are not of Him. Remember, we've seen this before, but we'll mention it again. Ephesians chapter 4, down in verse 22, where it says, You put off concerning the former manner of life, conduct, and behavior, this means. The old man is corrupt according to the seedful lusts. And you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and you put on the new man. We clothe ourselves, is what this means, like putting on a garment clothing ourselves, sinking into a garment. We're going to change our garments, and we're going to put on the garments of God. In fact, it's even, you must understand, what it says over in Romans chapter 13. When we are doing this, we are actually putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you put on, same word and duo, clothe yourself. And this, by the way, is a command unto you and me. And it's something that you do to see the benefit occur in your life because it's a middle voice verb. The middle voice means the subject is doing it for his benefit and effect in his life. So you and I are responsible to put on, to clothe ourselves. It's a command, imperative mood, 
the Lord Jesus Christ. You're actually putting on Jesus Christ through the word in you, in your mind and in your heart, and that you're incorporated into your lifestyle. And of course he says, make not provision or forethought for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Because remember, sin dwells in the body. We cannot be walking in the flesh ever. We must be changed and walking in the ways of the Lord. You put on the Lord Jesus Christ and you put off all these other things, it's going to bring change in your life as God's glory will be manifest. We go back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we have received mercy, we faint not. Whatever God's ministry he's given us, he's given us all the ministry of reconciliation, he's given us all the ministry of going forth, preaching the gospel, casting out demons, laying hands on the sick, and you may also have specific ministries according to the calling of God, the giftings of God in your life. We're not going to be feigning, we're going to be carrying it out, we're going to make sure that we do the things that we're to do. He says, we renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. This is important. We cannot be handling the word of God deceitfully. How would you handle the word of God deceitfully? Well, if you're leaving out some things, if you're ignoring some scriptures, if you really haven't studied the word the way you should, or you've kind of interpreted it towards the way you want to, to fit it into your belief system, which is what a whole lot of people have done, and no wonder they have so much error out there in the doctrines in the body of Christ. Remember, we get revelation. We don't figure things out ourselves. Every scripture will fit together like pieces in a jigsaw puzzle, and the scripture cannot be broken. It is truth, and it is only revealed to us by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, who will lead us and guide us into all truth. And so by manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We've got to be sure that we're handling the word properly. They, obviously, he was speaking it to them because they needed to correct, be correct on these things, corrected. And we see the same thing today. Anybody who's teaching the word, you better know the word and have studied out the scriptures, every scripture, and looked everything up. You better look up the tense voice and mood. You better find out what there's being said accurately and look at all the scriptures, look at the context. You can't just take things out of context and make a doctrine, which is what so many people have done, and no wonder we have problems. No, the ones who are the body of Christ are going to grow up and the ones are going to be the remnant, and they're going to get the precise, correct knowledge of God, and it's going to be accurate. It's got, they cannot handle the Word of God deceitfully in any way. We are to be sure we're functioning the way we should. And this is also, you can tell that the handling of God deceitfully is, they're kind of keeping things away, they're hiding things, essentially. You can tell it by the context, because look at the next verse. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Well, that meant that these guys were handling it deceitfully and they were kind of hiding some things and weren't bringing forth the whole truth, which is a mistake. It's hid to them that are lost, to those that are perishing. And then he goes on and says, whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel who is the image of God should shine into them. That's why you and I must preach the whole counsel of God. And that is absolutely essential. We can hold nothing back. We can't be the way seeker-sensitive churches are out there that only preach certain things that people like to hear and leave everything else out. We're not going to talk about sin. We're not going to talk about demons. We're not going to talk about your repentance. And we're not going to talk about all these things. What a mistake. We must bring the whole counsel of God or we are not being faithful. We are handling the word of God deceitfully. Look what it says in Acts 20, 20. He said, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you and have taught you, showed you, and have taught you publicly from house to house. We can't hold back anything that is profitable, which would be everything of the word of God. Verse 27, for I have not shunned to declare you all the counsel of God. Everything needs to be declared. Nothing is to be left out. And as we bring forth that so that the God can accomplish everything, the remnant the end time church will not hold anything back. They will teach the whole counsel of God so that the people can take hold of it and walk in it and possess the promises and conquer everything and make sure they're truly walking in the truth. At the same time, 
We cannot be preaching ourselves. Do we preach ourselves? No. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 5. We preach not ourselves. Don't talk about yourself, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake. All we do is say we're servants for the Lord. We don't preach ourselves or build up ourselves or try to exalt ourselves in some way. That's a mistake. Many people, they just talk about themselves and their accomplishments. That's a great mistake. In fact, many people who give testimonies, it's really more about themselves than about the Lord. If you're going to give a testimony, you're simply going to say the Word of God, of what God has done in your life and how He's accomplished things and that as you obeyed and did what He said. Well, we're not going to preach ourselves. We're going to preach what is right in His sight. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We're to preach the knowledge of God, to preach the true gospel and bring forth the truth to people. Notice in verse 7, he also says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, in this physical body, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Well, you and I are to have the power of God resident in us. That comes through the Word. The Word is the power of God, and you get the Word in you, the power of God will be resident within you. That's what you do when you put on the whole armor of God. The powers of God, not of us, nonetheless, and when it says we have this treasure, this is the word thesaurus, thesaurus in the Greek, which we get our English word thesaurus. Well, what is a thesaurus? A thesaurus is a collection of word meanings that are put in a book. So we're to be collecting things in our vessels. And what are we collecting? The word of God, the truth. The word written in our heart, the word written in our mind, causing the power of God to be resonant within us. And the excellence of the powers of God, the measure of the power of God is in you is the measure of the word in you. And you remember, that's why the devil comes to try to take the word out of your heart. You've got to be ready to resist the enemy because he wants to get it out of your heart because then you won't have the power of God resident in you. And you and I are to live by the power of God. That power is of his, him. At the same time, the enemy will come against you. They had lots of attacks. Look what it says in verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. They had lots of attacks. This doesn't say you're not going to have attacks. You are going to have attacks. The disciple is not above his master. Jesus was persecuted. You will be persecuted. That's why you've got to get strong. So you're not moved by what happens. And you use the Word of God to conquer every attack that the enemy would bring against you. You must get strong so you don't crumble and get beat up and, and just ha have a negative effect from things that come against you. You should be ready to overcome everything. They overcame what came at them. And how are you going to do it? It's going to be through your faith. You and I have a spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians 4.13, he's telling them, these are the things that are important for you, as we've already seen before. We've got these promises. We've got to get established. We've got to be obedient. We've got to get the mindset that we're always going to triumph. We've got to make sure that we're not corrupting the Word, that we have the Word rightly divided in us, and we've got the truth, and we're being changed. And we get the whole counsel of God so we're not leaving anything out. These are all things that we've seen that have to be incorporated into your life so far that he's telling them. And now he's telling them about their faith. Your faith is what will give you the victory. It overcomes the world. What is this faith that we have? 2 Corinthians 4.13 We have in the same spirit of faith. It's a spirit of faith. According as it's written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. You have a spirit of faith. In fact, we have the same spirit of faith because it is the faith of Jesus Christ. And you have a spirit of faith that you are going to operate and put in operation by believing the word in you and then speaking forth to release this general spirit of faith. Now remember, you have a general spirit of faith. But in order to get specific faith and see the promises come to pass, You've got to get the Word in you. And what happens when you get the Word in you? In Romans chapter 10, 
verse 17, it says this. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When the word comes to you, it produces faith as the word is written in your heart and produces hope in the area of the mind, in the soulish realm. And so you get specific faith. Then what do you do? Then you mix your spirit of faith with the word that you heard that produced specific faith to see the promises of God come to pass. That is important for you to understand. Hebrews 4, verse 1 and 2 makes it clear. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise be left us of entering into his rest. That's possessing the promise of God when we enter into his rest, spiritual rest. That any of you should seem to come short of it. God doesn't want us to come short of possessing any promise. We're to possess them all. And he goes on and says, For unto us was the gospel preached. Well, what's that mean? They heard the word, so faith came as they heard the word of God, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, even though it produced specific faith in their heart. Why? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. What are we talking about here? Mixed with faith, what faith? Your general spirit of faith. When the word comes to you, you must mix it with your general spirit of faith by believing that word and then speaking it or acting upon it and putting it into operation. As you believe the word, you'll keep it in your heart, you do what it says, and you speak it to release your faith to put it in operation. After we saw verse 13, we proceed ahead to verse 16. He says, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, which it is, we got this body of death that's perishing little by little, yet the inward man, that's the hidden man of the heart, is renewed day by day. How's it going to be renewed day by day? Through the word in you. Your inner man in your heart should be being renewed day by day through the word that's being written in your heart. As long as you're keeping it there and not letting the devil take it out, God wants you to get the word in you, and it's renewing you. It's causing you to grow. This means renewing you and causing you to grow up in the things of God and become strong, and that is what he wants. He says, for our light affliction, that's the pressure. The pressure will come. When you hear the word, remember, Satan comes immediately to try to take that word out. Well, when that light affliction, that pressure comes, it's but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory, because what do we do? We get our eyes on what we need to get our eyes on. We're not going to be moved by what the enemy does. He usually tries to get you to look at the senses, and look at neg negative things and so forth, get you off the word. No. While we look not at the things that are seen, not what's coming in the seen realm, the natural realm, trying to get you to succumb to that, but at the things that are not seen. That's the realm of the spirit. The things that are seen are temporal, subject to change, but the things that are not seen are eternal. We're going to tap into the unseen things, the eternal things of God, and take hold of promises, put his power and authority in operation, and conquer anything that would come against us and see our faith bring forth victory. That is what God wants. This tells us another thing. If you are going to be ready to walk in victory and overcome in these last days, you've got to get your faith developed. Remember, we all have the same spirit of faith. Our problem is not getting more faith. We already have faith. It's what we do with it. Our faith needs to grow. We've got to get our faith grow, growing in our life by applying it. Look at what it says, 2 Thessalonians 1, Thessalonians 1 3. We bound to thank God always for you, brethren, because it's meet that your faith groweth exceedingly. Your faith is to grow exceedingly. And also, your faith is to get strong. You're to become strong in faith. We see this over here in Romans 4.20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Your faith is to get strengthened. It's to grow. It's to become mighty. You don't need more of it. You see, you need to just use what you have and put it in operation. As you do what the Word says and put it in operation, it will grow. It's going to be strong, strong as you use it, as you put it in operation. So God wants you to get your faith developed. Another thing that was brought forth to the Corinthian church 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, we're always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. Ah, we have the confidence. We're just absent from the Lord at this point we're, while we're at home in the body. But, well, there'll be a day when we're going to be with Him. But nonetheless, we're still at home in this body, walking by faith, not by sight, eyes on Him, even though we're not apt at, with Him. We're confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Yeah, we can do that. But we have a ministry to carry out. We have a, a work that we're to do. We're to work out our own salvation. We are to be a vessels to minister for the Lord. We're to carry out that ministry to see other people come to the Lord. We instead, we want to carry out that ministry. There, wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Otherwise, you're just flowing in the things of God regardless of where you are, whether you're here or whether you're there in heaven. Otherwise, be busy doing the things that God wants you to do. Be serving the Lord and carrying out all that He wants you to do. And remember, everything that you're doing is important because we all are going to appear before Him, the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in His body. According to that, he hath done, whether good or bad. Well, that means we better make sure that we're not doing bad things because we are going to get there. Remember, all of our works are going to be tried. We already saw that. He covered that in the first letter to the church at Corinth. He said that, you know, if your works abide, you're going to receive a reward. But if your works get burned up, you're going to suffer loss, even though you'll be saved, yes, as by fire. Nonetheless, we want to be piling up rewards, not suffering loss. So make sure that you are doing the right things before the Lord. At the same time, remember we're to be reaching people and we need to preach the gospel to them because look what it says. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. This means the fear of the Lord because God is a just God. He's a loving God. He's a righteous God. Same time, He's not only a God who is loving but he's also a God who is a judge. He judges right in righteousness, and he's going to judge the world in righteousness. And into this church age, which is coming, the judgment is going to come. Remember, it comes to the church first, find out who's really going to follow him and not, or not, and it's also then going to come to the world. So knowing the fear of the Lord, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, and we want to help them. We want to get the truth to them, persuade men, so they will come to the place of receiving Jesus and turning away from the ways of darkness and walk in the ways of the Lord so that they will be on the road to being saved and following Him. God wants us to be reaching out to people, so we need to be doing the things that He wants. Which brings us to another point. We can't be living unto ourself. Remember, you're bought with a price. You're a purchased possession. You're not your own. You belong to Him. So what you should you be doing? You just you don't get born again and then just live your own life, you know, and just want God to come along and bless the things you do and then, you know, don't bother me when I'm doing whatever I want to do unless I got a problem and now I want you to come and help me. That's the way a lot of Christians live their life. It's ridiculous. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 15. And that he died for all, that they which live, which are all those that are born again, should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him who died for them and rose again. You and I are to live unto him. You do everything unto the Lord. You don't live unto yourself. Otherwise, that's a rejection of him. He purchased you. You are bought with a price. You are not your own. We saw that scripture earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We saw that today, this morning. So that means we belong to Him and we are to live unto Him. So you have a ministry of reaching people with the gospel. And he comes to verse 17 and he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Where? In spirit. Not on your soul and not on your body. He's only talking about in spirit. <laughs> all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ. Notice the word reconciled is the word katalasso, which means to 
see the change or the exchange occur. What exchange was that? We got a brand new spirit. The old spirit was taken out, and we got a new spirit that came in. That's why we're now a new creation in Christ, who has brought the exchange of, for us to himself by Jesus Christ, and he's also given us, you and me, the ministry of exchange. You gotta understand what you're doing when you're preaching the gospel to people. You are not only sharing what Jesus has done, but you're showing them that they need to get the exchange. What's their problem? Their spirit is not right with God because of the fall of man. And therefore, what do they need? They gotta get a new spirit. That's why all the false religions produce nothing because you've got to get a new spirit. The only way to get it is through the one who got the new spirit for you, which was Jesus, the first born from spiritual death unto spiritual life, the first person who's the first born from out of the dead. And so you and I, we got born from the dead. And what do we need? To get, we need to get people born from spiritual death unto spiritual life and teach them you need a new spirit. That's the answer. So they, we, God's given us the ministry of the exchange. He goes on and says, to wit, to know that God was in Christ reconciling, bringing this exchange of the world unto himself. Because remember, Jesus died spiritually separated from the Father. That's why he left him. First born from spiritual death unto spiritual life, down in hell when he got first born from the dead, got a new spirit. And he made it so that you and I could get a new spirit when we receive him. So through this, he reconciled the world unto himself. But also look at another thing that's important when you preach the gospel. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Meaning, he's not imputing or reckoning or accounting their sins and their trespasses unto them. Therefore, when you preach the gospel to people, what do you tell them? You tell them what Jesus Christ has accomplished and that they need the exchange of the old spirit that's not right for the new spirit that Jesus has that he got for all mankind. By How does that happen? By receiving Jesus and you'll get spiritually born from above. The old spirit will be gone and a new spirit will come in. Do you need to tell them to confess their sins and repent and turn away from their ways? No. Why? He's not imputing their trespasses unto them. That has nothing to do with them getting a new spirit. They need to receive Jesus. The way that people have approached preaching the gospel, most everybody in the body of Christ has been wrong. They got their six steps to salvation, you know. Acknowledge you're a sinner. You don't have to acknowledge you're a sinner. Confess your sins. You don't have to confess your sins. Repent of all your sins. You don't have to repent of all your sins. It's all false teaching. You only need to do one thing. Remember that we are convicted of what? We'll come back here in a moment. In John chapter 16 and verse 9. Remember when it talks about the Holy Spirit convicting of the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment? Well, what are we talking about? Of sin, not sins, plural. Sin, singular. One sin, which is what? because they believe not on me. That's the only sin that hinders them from receiving uh, reconciliation to the Father through Jesus Christ. That's why when you go preach the gospel, I don't care what they're involved in. I don't care what they look or what they're doing. It is irrelevant. You preach the gospel to them and tell them that they can receive Jesus and get a brand new spirit right as they are and you lead them to receive Jesus. What's gonna happen when they get a new spirit? They'll also get a new heart, and then what? Then God will start working through his presence in them to bring them to repentance. I remember when I got born again. Nobody told me, I got, wasn't around anybody, which was good probably, so I didn't get messed up by false teaching, and false ways. I just got one of those little Gideon Bibles and I read it in the back about the scriptures and that, this thing that said my decision to receive Christ as my Savior. I prayed the prayer. I signed my name on the line. I got born again. I didn't change my ways or confess any sins or repent of anything. I just received Jesus. And it changed my whole life. 
I got born again. And God began to work. Did all my sins, did I quit all my sins right away? No. But it wasn't too long where all of a sudden, I didn't want to do those things anymore. Because God's presence on the inside started to show you, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to go to all those things that, that people do and do all those evil things anymore. I want to turn away from all that. That's what God does. So remember, you have a ministry of reconciliation. You've got to make sure you preach the gospel accurately and show people what they need. God will, you let go, God will work on cleaning them up after they get born again. And of course, remember the other thing you want to do is immediately get them to receive the Holy Spirit because they get the Spirit of Christ, remember, but that's not the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, Holy Spirit is received after a person is born again. Remember, it's the Spirit, it's a promise, and it is a first fruit of our inheritance, and it is received after we're born again. The Holy Spirit, who is holy, is not going to come dwell in a spirit that's not right with God. That's why we've got to get a new spirit first. Then the Holy Spirit, who is holy, will come and dwell in us, having the Spirit of Christ. Therefore, then you lead them immediately to get the Holy Spirit in them. They need the Holy Spirit in them, so that then the Holy Spirit will be working to bring revelation and to be working in their life. We well, committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So what do you do? You go tell people there's an exchange that you need to receive. It's available for you. All you've got to do is understand what Jesus has done, believe the gospel, and receive him. And then it will bring forth the change on your life. Look what we see in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. This is when Jesus said, The time is fulfilled when he began his ministry. The kingdom of God's at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Many people think repent means repent of your sins. It didn't say repent of your sins. What's the word repent mean? The word repent means change your mind. It doesn't have anything to do with your sins. It doesn't have anything to do with your lifestyle. It has to change your mind. And do what? Believe the gospel. Oh, if I believe what Jesus did, then what will I do? I'll receive Jesus and I'll get born again. That's all that's necessary. And then God will begin to work in a people's lives. God wants you to understand you have the ministry of reconciliation. The gospel needs to be preached accurately. And no more of this false gospel preaching. Telling people they've got to change their ways and repent and so forth first. Look how many people, there have been millions, thousands I'm sure, of people that have thought, well, I'm not ready yet. I heard that all the time. Well, I'm not ready yet. Well, why aren't you ready? Because they think they have to change their ways before they come to the Lord. That's because the gospel's been taught falsely. You've got to change. No. You just come as you are. We've got to preach the gospel accurately. Just tell people that they need to receive Jesus and get a brand new spirit. You mean to tell me I don't need to change my ways and stop all these evil things? That's right. Just believe the gospel. If you believe it, truly, and you receive him, you'll be born again. He will come into you. You will get a new spirit and a new heart. And then God will start working, and he will work in their life to bring them to the place of wanting to desire to do the things that he wants, if they truly believe. God wants us to preach the gospel accurately. The next thing that we see that he talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 we want to become this perfected church. We've got to do things right, accurately. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we come down to verse 14. He says this, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? This is the word anomia, which means lawlessness. And what communion has light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement is the temple of God with idols? Well, the answer to every one of those is none. You are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. This means to come under an unequal or different yoke, to be tied to them in some aspect with unbelievers. No. That's why you don't have fellowship with them. You preach the gospel to them, but you don't get yoked to them. Or no fellowship, righteousness with lawlessness. 
No communion or fellow. Fel the word koinonia, which really means association or fellowship, has light with darkness. None. What concord or agreement does Christ have with something that's worthless and wicked? Nothing. What part is he that believeth with someone who is, doesn't believe, <clears throat> is an infidel? None. What agreement is the temple of God which you are with idols, anything else that becomes a source other than God? Nothing. You're the temple of the living God, as God said, I'll dwell in them and walk in them. See, God's not only come to dwell in you, but he wants to walk in you. And he's going to walk in you as you hear and do the word of God and follow his leading and what he wants to do in your life. And I'll be their God and they shall be my people. So he tells them, he says, wherefore come out from among them. All those things that were spoke of. You come out from the unbelievers. You come out from the lawlessness. You come out from the things that are worthless. You come out from the things that are not of God. And you be separate. This means mark off by boundaries. It is sad to see that many Christians have not obeyed this. They just get around whoever they want and do whatever they want to do. God says you're to be separate and you're to mark off by boundaries. You know, we can't be compromising the word of God for anybody, family members or whoever it might be. You're to mark off from boundaries, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And we can't be touching it. What happens if you're touching the unclean thing? What makes you unclean. You can't be allowing. This means somebody who's something that's not cleansed, it's going to contaminate you. That's why I already addressed that in the first letter about how you've got to get rid of all the leaven. A little leaven leavens the whole lump and it contaminates you. You can't let yourself be contaminated. We must get cleansed. In fact, it's interesting, this particular word, if you notice at number 169, the word Akathros, or Dartos, it's a word that we see used over in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Look what it says. For this you know, that no whoremonger nor unclean person, number 169, nor covetous man who's an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Unclean people don't get the inheritance of the kingdom. We can't have any uncleanness in us. Well, if you have a little leaven, it leavens the whole lump. That's why we got to get, get cleansed of everything in our life. It is mandatory to get cleansed. This is why we see this spoken in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Well, that would also imply that he knows those that are really not his. So who are the ones that are his? Well, then he goes on and says, And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, that would be someone who supposedly is his, depart from iniquity. The word iniquity is unrighteousness, adikia, meaning unrighteousness. He is told to depart from this. And this is a command. If we claim to be a Christian, we say that we are one of his, we are commanded to depart from unrighteousness. What's unrighteousness? Sin. All sin. Because what does it do? It contaminates us, makes us unclean. In a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Well, that's a person. One is a dishonor is one who's disgraced. He goes on and says, If a man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared into every good work. We ought to go back and think about it. What determines whether you are a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor or disgrace? Whether you're going to be you know, shown God's grace or shown, shown to be one who's going to be disgraced? It all depends on what you and I do. If a man, therefore, purge. This is the word meaning to cleanse out. It's got a prefix on this word, ek. Cleanse out or cleanse thoroughly, complete cleansing. From these, what was that? The unrighteousness that he's talking about. He shall be a vessel unto honor. So what determines whether you're a vessel of honor? It depends on whether you have cleansed yourself, you've been gotten rid of all this 
cleansed thoroughly from all the unrighteousness. You've departed from it. You've obeyed that command. And meat, you're sanctified. That's going to be the result of that. When you get rid of all this and you walk in the way of the Lord, then you'll be one who has been sanctified. This means, when it says this, it's showing the fact that, it's implying the fact that you did this work and it, you continue to walk in this now, this new way of walking in holiness, having been cleansed. Because it is a perfect tense verb. The perfect tense means action completed in the past with present effects at the time of speaking. Meaning, you got, went through this cleansing process and you got cleansed out thoroughly of all this. This work was completed in the past. And now, the effects of it are today because you are clean. You are holy before the Lord now. That is what he wants. And meat for the master's use. And prepared, made ready unto every good work, which is what we're to be. Well, who are the ones that are meat for the master's use and prepared unto every good work? The ones who've been sanctified, that are holy which are the ones who have cleansed themselves and become a vessel of honor because they got rid of all the uncleanness out of your life. This points out another important thing. You and I must be cleansed. In fact, look at the scripture. It says over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing you have purified or cleansed your souls, how? In obeying the truth through the Spirit. How can I cleanse my soul? By doing what the Word says. It will have that cleansing effect because of the Word in your life. You obey the truth through the Spirit. That's what is necessary. In fact, we can even see this implied, and we've talked about this in the past, in John chapter 15, when it talks about bringing forth fruit. Verse 2 says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he takes away. Why would they not be bearing fruit? Because they're not doing the word. Every branch that bears fruit, he's doing the word. Is that all he needs, needs to be done? No, that's just the beginning. He purgeth it, he cleanses it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Well, that means the cleansing process has to go forth first before more fruit comes. When it says that it may bring forth, this is a subjunctive mood verb, meaning a conditional statement, meaning that it may, if conditions are met, bring forth more fruit. And this is to be on an ongoing basis that this is, this conditions have been met, present tense. Then he comes to and says, now you are clean, it says, through the word that I've spoken unto you. Does the word spoken unto you automatically make you clean? No. What's the problem here? First of all, the word is dia in the Greek for through. Dia, you must understand, here's the word dia. When it is a genitive case nouns after it, it is going to be translated through. There's five cases in the Greek. If it's an accusative case, it is translated because of. Let's look what it is. Here's dia. What follows it? That's the definite article, accusative. And here is the noun word, logon, which is accusative. So that's, what's that mean? That means it means because of, not through. In other words, you are clean because of the word, is Young's. This is why we put Young's up there, because he did a tremendous job on translating things correctly. You're clean because of the word that I've spoken unto you. Well, again, does that mean that the word spoken unto you did this? No. There's more you must understand, because when it says I have spoken it unto you, does that mean I just heard it? No. Why? Because this is a perfect tense verb. What's the perfect tense again? The perfect tense means action completed in the past with present results at the time of speaking, implying that the word, because of the word that was spoken to you in the past, which you took hold of to see the cleansing process work in your life, with the present effects at the time, meaning 
Oh, you took hold of the word, it did a work in you, and the present effects are now. You're clean because of the word that you took hold of to. Remember, you purify your soul through the obedience of the word of God. That is what he wants. There's also another aspect of the purifying, because when we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we saw we were in verse 17, he said, if you come out from among them and be separate, mark off from boundaries and touch not the unclean thing, I'll receive you. And then he says, and I'll be a father unto you. Well, wait a minute. Back here, it just said he's God and you're my people. Now it's talking about being a father unto you. Well, that's denoting a personal, intimate fellowship. And you're now my sons and daughters. Well, that shows close association because you're walking in his ways. Saith the Lord Almighty, the ruler, the mighty God who does a work in your life. And so he goes on and says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, we got all these promises we're to possess, let us cleanse ourselves. So having said all that, that we're supposed to you know, not touch these things, he also now is saying, having these promises, we're supposed to cleanse ourselves. Here we see, this is the word, and what about this? That means it's conditional statement, subjunctive mood. That we might cleanse ourselves if we meet the conditions to see the result, which is perfecting holiness and the fear of God. That's where we want to get to, to be holy. We might cleanse ourselves from what? All filthiness of the flesh and spirit. That means anything of the flesh, all those works got to be eliminated. We put them all away. We crucify the flesh daily. We get rid of everything that's of the flesh. We cannot be walking in the flesh. All the works of the flesh, any kind of evil. That's all the things that are listed there that we've see, seen so many times in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21, over in Ephesians chapter 4, when it talked about all these works of the flesh that we need to get rid of, the lying, the stealing, the anger, the bitterness, the resentment, the clamor, the evil speaking, all these things. Get rid of all the works of the flesh, but there's also something else. Cleanse from all filthiness of the spirit. What's the filthiness of the spirit? It's not talking about our spirit, because our spirit is the spirit of Christ. What's the filthiness of the spirit? Evil spirits that are in the soul and body that have to be cast out. This is why we need to engage in deliverance. What's our motive to engage in deliverance? Just to get free of a problem, get rid of my pain or my disease or this situation? No, that's a selfish reason and not a scriptural reason. Our reason for getting rid of the filthiness of the spirit is to perfect holiness in the fear of God, get rid of everything that's unclean that would hinder us from walking in the way of the Lord. And as you do that, you will get delivered. You will get healed. You will get set free from whatever the bondage is. But our real motivation is to be holy before God. See, many people, they just want to get free of your problem. Of all the years I've been ministering deliverance, I'm 35 years or so, most everybody comes, they just want to get rid of their problem. I say, great. That's why I talk to them about all their problems and go through that list, the beginning list. This is the beginning point for you. Circle all the problems in your life. Well, I just came to get delivered of this. Well, how about circling every problem? Because God wants to do a total work. And that's just a beginning point because what's deliverance really to do? It's to bring a total cleansing of all the filthiness of the Spirit in all areas of your life. Because He wants to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Who are they going to be the ones that are going to be presented to him? The ones that are holy, right? Who are the ones that are going to have the glory of God poured out upon them? The holy ones, the righteous ones that are walking uprightly before him. This brings us to another point he brought to them. We come to 2 Corinthians 7, 10. He says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death a godly sorrow that works repentance. Now this is going to be talking about dealing with our sins. This is talking to Christians. A godly sorrow over what? Over the sins we've committed, which will bring us to the place of changing our mind and not walking him. Do you have a godly sorrow over your anger? Do you have a godly sorrow over being fearful? Do you have a godly sorrow over fornication or lust, you have a godly sorrow over doing evil things of any type, you should. 
That's going to bring a repentance in your life. He goes on and says, For behold, the selfsame thing that you sorrowed after our godly sort. And if you do, it's going to cause you to deal with that problem. Not just hope, you know, I'll confess my sin and I'll just kind of try my best to get rid of it. No. What carefulness, this is the word spude, which means earnestness and diligence it wrought in you. Otherwise, when you have a godly sorrow over something, I'm going to be earnest and diligent to get this thing out of my life. What clearing of yourselves. You want to clear yourself of the Get this thing out. What indignation. You're spiritually irritated that this thing has been in your life and been an area of sin that's caused destruction. What fear. The fear of the Lord realizes, I've got to get this out or I'm going to, judgment's going to come upon me. Because if I walk in sin, I'll be judged. And I'll see the effects of the destruction. What vehement desire. What longing to get free of the problem. What zeal. I'm going to be zealous to do something about this thing. What revenge. I'm going to revenge against that enemy. And I'm going to drive the enemies out of my life and cast them out and resist every temptation. I'm not going to give place to this again. Look at this attitude. In all of these things, you've reproved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Otherwise, you're going to get after this thing and get rid of it out of your life. You're going to do something about it. That is true evidence of godly sorrow. If that doesn't happen in your life, then you don't really have a godly sorrow yet. Well, yeah, I know I have a problem and I need to get rid of it and I'll try my best. <laughs> That's not going to get it done. You've got to get diligent. You've got to get some indignation, the fear of the Lord, vehement desire, zeal, and ready to revenge the enemy. You're going to do something about this. You're not going to let this thing stay in you any longer because you know judgment's going to come upon you. Demons are going to be coming into you. You're not going to be right with the Lord. You're going to have unrighteousness in you. And if you don't depart from unrighteousness, you're not going to be cleansed. You're going to be in trouble. God wants us. This is what he wrote to them. You deal with all these sin areas in your life with a godly sorrow that works true repentance. We come to the next area. 2 Corinthians 10. Down in verse 5, and he says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness, being prepared and ready to revenge all disobedience. Again, this is coming against any of this. And when your obedience is fulfilled, this is governing your mind, so you don't let the devil have place in your mind. The battleground with the enemy is in the soulless realm. And he will work through the emotions or try to get to your will, but he especially is going to work through your mind, the thoughts that come into your mind. Well, you've got to be ready to cast down any imaginations, anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If this, is not, this thought or this desire is not in line with the Word of God, I've got to get rid of this thing. And bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Is this obedience of Christ? No, this is sin. I've got to cast that thing down and bring it into captivity in line with the Word of God. I'm going to look what the Word says, so I do that. And have it in a readiness. You're going to be re ready to revenge, prepared and ready to revenge the disobedience. And where's the disobedience coming from? The devil and or the flesh. And the flesh has en it's an enemy, essentially, because sin dwells in it when your obedience is fulfilled. That's why you got to govern. You got to make your body a slave. You can't let your body dictate anything. You got to walk by the Spirit. We talked about that today. And get things in order in your mind so you don't give place to the enemy. And of course, well, that means we got to guard ourselves. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, 7, and 8. Be careful, be anxious for nothing. And that'd be an anxiety thought coming in your mind, feelings or you know, against you. What am I going to do? I'm going to pray the Word of God. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests, legal demands, be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard. This is the word phoreo, meaning to guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's going to guard you from these attacks. And then you're going to, of course, correct it by thinking correctly on what God wants. Whatsoever things are true, in line with the truth. Things that are honest, that are going to be the things that will be honorable before God. 
things that are just or righteous, things that are pure and holy, clean, things that are lovely, acceptable and pleasing to God, things that are of a good report, any virtue or moral excellence, any praise, think on these things. If they're not on this checklist, cast them down and bring them in obedience to the Word of God. If we don't do that, we'll get placed to the devil left and right in our mind. And no wonder we have problems going on in our life if we don't govern our mind. God wants us to get our mind set on the things that he wants. Remember what it says over in Romans, chapter 8, that's Romans. In chapter 8, verse 5, they that are after the flesh, wherever your focus is, they're going to mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, how would I be after the Spirit? I'm thinking in my mind, what's the Word say? Is this in line with the Word? No, I'm casting that down. I'm throwing that out. I'm not going to give place to that for a second. That's important. A carnal mind, thinking after the flesh, what I want to do, what I feel like doing, my attitude, my thought, without considering what the Word says, that's a carnal mind. It's death. But to be spiritually minded, a word-ruled mind is life and peace. Because I'm going to think, what does the spirit world of Jesus Christ, you know, the spirit way, which is the word, going to tell me what to do? Remember, his word is spirit and it's life. So it's going to, you're going to get your think, mind thinking on what the word says. That is the key. And we need to be ready to do what the word says at all times. And that's how you're also going to not be deceived. Because the mark of the last days is deception. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. And it speaks of these false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming them into the apostles of Christ. No marvel, Satan himself transformed in an angel of light. No great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. You know, they're trying to act like ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Well, how am I going to know if they're right or wrong? if they're of the Lord or not, if they're false or true. You're going to check things out in line with the Word. Remember, the Holy Spirit does not originate anything. He takes the things that He hears above and brings them forth to us, meaning they're always going to be in line with the Word. See, that's what the Bereans understood, and they were smart about things. It says they were more noble in Acts 17.11. These, talking about the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. You've got to make, have readiness of mind. And search the scriptures daily whether the things were so. If it's not in the line with the word of God, you want to kick it out. You don't even want to listen to it. You've got to guard yourself so you, don't, you check everything out in line with the word of God. And that is mandatory. We also must realize that the attacks of the enemy will come against us, and we've got to be ready to deal with anything that would come against us. In 2 Corinthians, we come to chapter 12. Paul. Paul was one who was, got all this tremendous revelation, and God was exalting him. Lest I should be exalted above measure, God was exalting him. Through the abundance of the revelations, God gave him all the revelations, so he'd be exalted in the eyes of the people. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger, the angel of Satan, to buffet me and strike at me repeatedly. Now, the devil was attacking him, trying to stop him from getting exalted. Lest I might be exalted above measure. This was not Paul exalting himself. This was God exalting Paul. The reason you know it, because it is a passive voice. It's not an active voice, him exalting himself. It's a passive voice. Somebody else was exalting him. And the devil was attacking, trying to stop it. So who was doing the exalting? God was doing the exalting. Did Paul understand all these things about what he should do? Not yet. He had to learn, just like you and I. He said, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And had nothing happened because he didn't do what he needed to do. And so God said to me, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee. Does that mean I'm supposed to put up with it? No. What's the word sufficient mean? The word sufficient means to be able to defend, 
to ward off, to possess unfailing strength. In other words, my grace gives you the strength to ward off and defend yourself against these attacks. Because the grace of God will bring your deliverance. It's God's favor. It's through the word of God where the power of God is resident in it. For my power, not strength, dunamis, it's the word dunamis, is made perfect in weakness. What weakness? His weakness in the flesh. He was trying to deal with it in the flesh. And he was trying to just get God to take care of the thing instead of operating in authority as he was supposed to and take dominion. Most gladly, therefore, will I gladly rather glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Ah, he learned he could operate in the power of God. Remember the first missionary journey? He got wiped out left and right. But he learned, and then he began to use his authority. He began to cast out the spirit of divination out of that one who was trying to hinder him. And he, that one who was trying to turn the deputy away from the faith, a mist of darkness was put upon him. He couldn't see. He was blind temporarily. <laughs> that finished him off. He didn't succumb to that stuff anymore. Instead, he stopped the works of the enemy by the power of God, the authority and power of God. That is what God wants. You must understand you are to operate in power. You're to live by power. It even says in 2 Corinthians 13, 4, For though he was crucified through weakness, and yet he liveth by the power of God. We also are weak in him, in the fact that we have a body that's weak, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Well, how's the power of God come into us? Through the word. You're to get full of power. In the book of Acts, these guys that saw the great glory manifested, they were full of faith, they were full of wisdom, they were full of the Holy Ghost, and they were full of power. Power. The power of God is to be in you. You are to increase and be get full of power through the word in you. That's what you are going to live by. Well, these guys, they had, he was giving them all the answers of what they needed to do. And we come down to 2 Corinthians 12, and we pick up here in verse 20. He says, For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, the way I want you to be, and that I shall be found unto you as, as you would not. Otherwise, I'm going to come, and you're not going to like the way I'm going to come, because I will correct you on these matters. Lest there be debates, Envyings, stri wrath, stripes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, which is confusion and disturbances going on. Does God want a Christian involved in debates? No. Envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, any kind of things that cause confusion and disturbance? No. It's not of the Lord. Verse 21. And lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I may shall bewail many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lasciviousness which they've committed. These guys were unclean. That meant they weren't right with God. They never repented. They didn't turn from it. He expected them, and he says, so he comes and he says this, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Otherwise, he'd already come and talked to him and come to him. Now he's coming a third time to him to get these guys to come to the place of repentance. But they weren't listening to him. We come to verse, we saw verse 4, we're to live by the power of God. And then he tells them in verse 5, examine yourselves. you got to test and examine yourself, whether you're really in the faith or not. Prove, test, examine your own selves. Know you not, your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate, that means the fact that you have turned away, you've been disapproved by God. Why would that be? Because they were unclean and they hadn't repented and they hadn't dealt with things in their life. You see, God wants everybody to get clean, to be holy, to walk in His ways, to be doing His works, to be carrying out the ministry of the Lord, to come to the place to see this fruition, the fruit of God's work accomplished in our life and bring us to the place of perfection. In fact, he comes down there, and this is what he says to him. He says, we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Otherwise, you can't resist the truth. The truth is what you've got to live by. We're only going to do things for the truth. And then he tells him, after that, he says, 
For we are glad when we're weak, you are strong, and this also we wish, or this means we pray for you. We're praying for you, your perfection. What does God want? He wants the church to come to perfection and completion and see that complete work finished in every single one of us. He will do the work if we do what the Word says. But we're going to have to come in line with everything He tells us to do. And then we come to verse 11, and this is what he's, his final statement to him. He says, finally, brethren, he doesn't say farewell. That's a great error. It's the word kairo, which means to rejoice, be glad. It's a command to them. He's not giving them a little farewell thing. I don't know why they translate it that way. Young's corrects it, means rejoice. It's, a, it's imperative mood, and it's present tense. He's commanding you and me to continually be rejoicing. Be of good comfort, which is the word also which means encouragement. Be continually being encouraged and comforted. Be of one mind. These are all commands. We are now to come of one mind. Come to the place of being, have the mind of the Lord, our mind renewed to the truth, the mind of Christ. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Otherwise, quit all the strife and this arguments and all this, this anger and all these fleshly things that are no good. God wants us all to come to the place of rejoicing and be perfect, be perfected. He wants you to come to completion because you and I are to be a part of the mighty, perfected, glorious end-time church. And if we will do what he says, he'll see this be accomplished. So he's telling him in this second letter, this is what you need to do. I mean, there's going to be persecution, church, but there's promises. And you're to get established firm in the word and take hold of them. You need to be obedient. You can always triumph in every situation, but you've got to rightly divide the word of truth and get the word. You've got to get changed from glory to glory. And you've got to get the whole counsel of God in you. And you've got to put your faith in operation, continually working your faith to take hold of every promise. You need to be functioning in the ministry of reconciliation he's called you to. You've got to come out of all the uncleanness. Total cleansing has to happen. And that means also repentance. Repentance, godly sorrow, to turn away from it. And get your mind under control. Mind is it to be, is it be taking your thoughts captive and come in line with the obedience of Christ and make sure you're not listening to any of these false guys. Check it out in line with the Word of God. You're going to live by the power of God. You're to examine yourself and prove yourself. And you can't be those who are resisting what He wants and not be, have repented. No. You want to be sure that you're doing what the Word says. And He wants you to come to be perfected, to come to the place of perfection in the Lord. So rejoice, get perfected, be encouraged, be of one mind, get your, th your mind renewed to the truth, live in peace, and the God of love and peace be with you, and he will bring you to the place of being a part of the mighty, perfected, glorious, end-time church. That is where we're headed. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of God's Word to the church to bring them in line, to move on to perfection. I thank you. I will take heed to the Word of God and see these things be accomplished in my life. And as I walk in your ways, I will be changed. I will come in line with the Word of God and I will be holy, I will be righteous, I will be clean, my mind will be filled with the Word, I will be full of power, and I will go on to perfection. I thank you for accomplishing this great work in my life, because I am a hearer and a doer of your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. It's an important message tonight, as they all are. I trust you take heed to it and see God accomplish this great work in your life because that's what he purposes and he will do it when you and I allow him to accomplish it. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're going to continue. 
on Wednesday night, talking more as we go through the New Testament, looking at very important principles that are, that are necessary to become the mighty, perfected, glorious church. This is the work God's going to do. Get your mind on that. Be aware of what's going on in the world, but don't get all embroiled with all these things. Get in tune with what God wants for you. Praise God. If you need prayer, I invite you to come forward. Otherwise, God bless. Have a great week as you are seeking the Lord and, and doing everything that he says that you're to do. Hallelujah. God bless. You're dismissed.